A. So I'm going to start. Thank you very much. So I'm going to talk about easy logging with log message structured and message passing. Uh, so that's me. I'm Damien Krotkin. My nickname is Dams. I'm a member of Paris.pm member. Pearl French Longer. French Pearl Longer, sorry. I'm also a dancer developer and I do stuff on CPAN. And I wrote a book, but we don't care. OK, so let's say I have a very big application, and it processes a lot of data. OK? And it computes lots of lines. So I, I simplified a bit. But basically, we have lines, and we need to compute it. And um, these data, these uh, lines, they come from different users, and, and users come from different accounts. OK? So, uh, Basically, we have this diagram. So you can see we have multiple accounts. In one account, we have multiple users. And uh, we have tons of lines that we want to process somehow and have a result. So that is very good. It runs fine, except when it doesn't. And of course, I'd like to know what's going on with it. First of all, I'd like to know uh, what's up with the application when it crashes, OK? Like, why did it crash? Uh, what's the reason? Uh, so like the, 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 the message it uh, says. And what's the, what's the stack trace? Where, we, where uh, are we when it crashes and so on? But I want that, that crash time. But more importantly is what's the situation you know, when it crashes? Uh, I think that's uh, as important as why it crashed. So what was the data it was processing? And yeah, sorry. And uh, all of that uh, contextual information. And even when it doesn't crash, but when there are issues, I want to know how bad the failure is. Because sometimes you can recover from failure and skip to skip that wrong lines and so on. So uh, why did it fail to process this data line? Is it only this line? Can I reproduce it? And how uh, am I supposed to reproduce it? And does the rest fail? Meaning when I switch to the next uh, line, the next user, the next account, does it fail or does it continue to fail or can it cope with, uh, with the error? And even when, when the application runs fine, I want to, uh, yeah. Even when the app runs fine, actually, this is what happens. Information harvesting loop, meaning step one, you get more information about the process. You know, how long does it take? Uh, how is your computation machine uh, looking like? And so on. Good. And then you go see your boss or your colleague and so on, and you give, it, you give him your uh, data. Like, OK, this is how it runs. And suddenly, he or she asks you something uh, you don't know, and you go back to step one. Oh, crap. That doesn't work, really. <laughs> OK, and so you go back to the loop where you have to dig more information about uh, all the stuff, uh, the machines, the process, the time, uh, and so on, even though the app runs fine. OK, it's just about getting more information. So yes, what I do need is some kind of logs. but. We knew that, didn't we? So let's talk about logs. Actually, let's talk about something else instead first. Let's talk about exceptions. Because exceptions, uh, it's an issue, OK? And all issues are maybe not fatal. So that's, I think, important when you have a die or a croak or an exit or something like that in your process, maybe it's not the end of the world. So what you're going to do is uh, catch the exception and see if you can deal with it, uh, with it or not. 
To do that, you need to, uh, so you can, you can use try catch. And, uh, but that means that you need the exception module. So either you pick uh, an exception module from CPAN, but I wrote mine anyway because uh, I actually uh, wrote the denser exception module and so I took it, I extracted it as a standalone module. And in this module, exceptions are objects with uh, message, message pattern, stack trace, raise, throw. I mean, you can do a bunch of stuff with uh, this exception, and that's very useful because you also have introspection. How is that related to logging? We'll see about that. But basically, if you use an exception module, and if you use try catch, then you can do, yeah, I should put that on CPAN one day, then you can do these sort of things where actually your process is about here, and you say, oh, so basically for each account, I loop on the user, and then I loop on all the data line I want to process. If something happens here, well, it's, it's not such a big deal, you know, one line failed, okay, so you don't need to crash and stop your whole process. You can just log at a warning level about it and then you go out of the data loop, and if you have a crash which is not caught by this uh, try-catch, then it's a bit more important because that means that whole user data is uh, wrong or something is not going uh, perfectly fine at the user point. And you do the same at the account level, and so you use the different uh, level of logging to catch your exceptions. And of course, if you didn't catch an exception, it means that it's very, very important. And so then you log it, and then you allow it to crash. So now we can talk about logging. Uh, so when people want to log, basically what they do is they start, start with print or say. Like print warning, the data is not good. But then they want to display the data, so warning the data, and then they include the data in the message, saying it's not good. And then they print it with the a level, like warning, important, and so on. And then to make it prettier, uh, they have a generic log uh, uh, function, because you might want to log on a console, but also on a file, and so on. And then you wrap that in a module, and then you have a class, an object, and you've, re you've rebuilt an entire logging module homemade. So, don't do that. What you should do is, yeah. Basically, uh, I've seen a lot of people do that. Uh, that's what I call homemade logging system. <laughs> I've seen that in every single company I've worked in, they had at least one uh, homemade logging system. I've seen uh, more than one logging system per project. So that's not very helpful. And that's because it's actually e so easy to start in Perl by saying print to standard output or print to a file. That people, yeah, you know, you need log in, in the next two minutes. So you just start to do that and then you're in trouble. So stop reinvent reinventing the wheel. What you need is pick up a logger. There are tons of them on CPAN, so I'm sure you will find one that suits your needs. What I did is I chose uh, log dispatch because it uh, it's, was simple enough for what I needed. Uh, log for Perl is another very good choice if you need more precise uh, behavior. So here it is. Log, so you have to create uh, and define a new logger. And you call log on the level and the message is there. So that we log blah. Cool, now we have a logger. But actually, we are still nowhere. Why? Because we want contextual information, OK? Uh, logging a line saying the data is not good is not going to help us. So when we think about, uh, when we think about logging, what do we need to log? Obviously, we, not, we need to log the logging message, right? But it's quite useful to have a lot of hardware information, like memory, CPU, disks and so on, uh, this state. So like, what, uh, what's the situation of the hardware when you log things? Same with software. The time it, take, uh, it took to come here, the time uh, uh, remaining, and so on. And then uh, we have the message, and we want to know where we are 
into the file. So a log line is actually a mix between contextual information and specific information. And even with a great logger, you need to build that by hand. So how are we going to pack all this information into uh, our log line? We could use a key value structure or, a bit better, we uh, could use a class where the fields that we want to, uh, uh, to, to know about are actually attributes. So because they are attributes, we can, uh, uh, of a class, then we can use uh, laziness, uh, default values, and so on. And, and that's going to help. And so basically, one log line is one class instance. And because at the end, we still want to log all that stuff using log dispatch, we need to transform all that thing into a string. And so we need a stringifier. And you pick your own, but basically, JSON, YAML, whatever, to stringify your log structure so that you have the message and the contextual information in one string. That's what log message structure is made for. It's, it's here to help you create, create this uh, class and to organize your structured logging. Basically, the idea is very simple. Uh, it's a set of roles that you have to consume in a class you build. So, for instance, my event, my event. There are four types of roles. The first one is the main one. So, basically, when you consume this role, uh, you have the basic, basic setup of the structured contextual information plus string overloading. Then you have components, and that's where it becomes interesting after 10 minutes, is that uh, you can pick actually different components that are already written and use that into your My Events class. For instance, you have a component that gives you the host name. You have a component that gives you the time, the time elapsed since uh, the start, and a bunch of stuff. And so that means that there are already uh, components that you can use and have free contextual information without having to uh, spend time writing them. And of course, uh, you have to pick up one role to stringify your structure into a string, so JSON or YAML, for instance. So, okay, so here is an example. I have an event class here. And I say, let's consume log message structured. And I want that, uh, I want to uh, use the date component so that each line of logs, uh, which is uh, printed, contains date. And it will also contain the host name and it will stringify to JSON. That's very simple. What do we put in this uh, class? In addition to this stuff, we still want a message and then we uh, add our. Uh, business information, in our case, account ID and user ID, okay? And in your code, instead of logging something using log dispatch with just a message, you call log dispatch and here, instead of just the, the, the string message, you uh, build up a new event with the account ID, user ID and the message. And the result is that it's sending the stringified JSON representation of that to log dispatch, and somewhere we should have this. So it's actually on one line, and that's the JSON representation of your log line. So here your message, watch out behind you, is there in the message uh, field, but you have for free all the contextual information. That is Awesome. It also supports options passed on the command line so that basically uh, if you can run your program for, any, uh, for a given account ID, then you just pass it on the command line and if you've declared it in your class, it will be automatically uh, here in the JSON representation. But this code is a bit long, so let's shorten it. <coughs> well, that's an example. In, our, uh, in my case, actually, the account ID and the user ID, you remember the loop? It's not a for each loop, it's a kind of while where you have an iterator on the account user and the iterator on the user and on the data. 
So that means that these stuff are uh, global-ish, for instance, singletons. Okay? And that means that in your event class, you're not obliged to require the logger, uh, the, the user that wants to log, to pass the account ID and the user ID. You just ask it to the iterator, like, OK, give me the current account ID and give me the current user ID. So that when you use this uh, log message structure, you just uh, write a, a small wrapper, for instance, log warning, and you only give the message. And it would actually call a uh, dispatch logger with creation of your log event will, with all the uh, parameters. And account ID and user ID will be picked up automatically by default from your iterator, which is a single term. And then that outputs the same stuff with here your IDs. Is that OK up to now, or do you have any question? No? OK, good. Let's talk about exceptions. So if you remember, I said exceptions are good. You need to catch them. And why actually do you, you want to catch them? You want to catch them because you want to log them. Okay? Because exceptions are not always fatal, so it's not the end of the world. So it, if it's not the, the end of the world, you want to know about them. So you want to log them. You want to do something like that. Try, catch, log, warning, and you give it the exception. Okay? And for that, all you need to do is change a little bit your mylog event class. Uh, you need to add an additional attribute, like exception, because you want to be able to call it with that. And you will write a build args, which mash up the arguments that uh, are given to the creation of the instance. And this small function will grab the exception. And if it comes from your exception class, then it will look into it using introspection and pick up the stack trace, the error message, and the line number. And it will transfer this information to the log structure. Uh, to the log structure. And this will then be stringified to JSON. So that means that, so that's the code actually of the build logs. So instead of uh, uh, keeping the exceptions, uh, the exception, if it's of your exception um, modules you've used, then you know that you can get the message and also, for instance, the stack trace. And then you put that into hash, which is passed to your event creation. Okay. And that's why that would work. Now, log message, message structured, it does the job. Uh, if you want, please contribute because we need more components. Uh, yeah, I forgot to mention that log message structure is an original ID from Thomas Duran, which is about there. Uh, we've rewrote it. Uh, I think I have maintenance now, but I'm not sure. Uh, and anyway, it's great, but uh, we would like, if you want to contribute and write more components, because we have date, hostname, and easy stuff like that, but uh, it would be good if we had more. We need more stringifier because we have JSON, YAML, and uh, SPRINTF and stuff like that, but more is better. And we need to uh, make it compatible with Moo or even compatible with no object system if we want to have uh, better performance or different performance. It's on CPAN and GitHub. So we have everything we need as JSON. That's good, but that's not enough. Because your boss or colleague or whatnot wants to look at the log and you're there like, uh, it's a bunch of files with uh, JSON, which is uh, not easy to read, and so on. So you need to provide a simple interface. And on a separate track, you need to do complex lookup and research, because having everything in JSON with a lot of information in a lot of files is not very helpful. So you need to provide, uh, you need a powerful search engine. Also, here we have just looked at logs coming from your application and going to a file or on the console and so on. But what if at the same time you also want to receive the logs coming from your database or coming from your uh, Redis MQ events or for other system lo logs and so on? That's, uh, that's a bit problematic. So basically we're going to do two web interfaces. The first one should be easy to use, so we're going to use Dancer to build it, and we're going to use MongoDB as a database because you can just put stuff in there. 
And one, so it's document oriented, so one document would be one line of log, I think, yeah. And it indexes stuff and it's cool. And you can use this, we will use this interface to see easily the time history of the logs. Natural manner. And yeah, we would group them by job, host name, and present it by time. And the second one is more for data mining. And we will use Elasticsearch because you just throw a bunch of stuff at it and automatically it index stuff and you can do very powerful search requests on it. So to do that, oh Jesus Christ, I spoiled it. Anyway, to do that, uh, we need a big stuff here uh, that can take uh, on the left as inputs, you want to be able to uh, give it anything like syslog, uh, redisMQ logs, uh, your own logs, uh, logs from the database and stuff. And here you have something, and as output, you want to be able to uh, log to standard files, but also to our easy uh, 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 web uh, interface, okay, the tensor stuff, and also to Elasticsearch. And that big stuff is message passing, also written by Thomas Doran over there. And it's a log stash like, but in Perl and with style ish. Uh, basically, uh, it's a daemon, so it's based on any event. Uh, the basic concepts are you have inputs, filters, and outputs. So it's very simple. It's like, a, yeah, uh, so basically you have stuff in inputs. You may want to, to work a little bit on it, but then at the end you output them. You can run it, run it as a command line, or uh, you can build up uh, script using the DSL, so that uh, a daemon, sorry, using the uh, simple um, DSL commands, so that's what I'm going to demonstrate. Or you can also use the classes directly if you need more powerful usage of that. So in uh, my example, so that's the real life, the software I'm talking about, it runs on many machines, okay? Like a lot. And they are already connected because that was before I came to this company, they are already connected to one syslog ng server. And uh, it's already writing to log files on the disk. Uh, and so, yeah, I didn't want to, you know, um, rebuild the log, uh, the, the entire log uh, systems, so I had to, I wanted to still be nice to my administrator and so on. So basically we agreed with him that in, in addition to the regular logging system that was in place, what we would do is configure syslog ng to not only write to files, but also output to different uh, direction to a named pipe somewhere on the uh, file system. And we would use this uh, entry as input to message passing. And yeah, I already said that. Yeah, web interface dense uh, MongoDB and search interface. In, uh, okay. Anyway, uh, basically that's what we have. Well, that's what we had uh, at my company originally. Many machines, log, syslog, ng, logging to standard files, and we add this stuff, duplicated flow going to message passing. Okay, so message passing will have only one input, uh, and uh, we have to send it to Elasticsearch and MongoDB. And on top of this database, we will build a web GUI uh, using Dancer, sorry, Dancer here, and directly Elasticsearch plugin to do powerful search. This is uh, what should be designed in a better world. You see, we would use some kind of uh, message queue logging to directly hit on message passing instead of relying on syslog engine. So let's use message passing. Step one, configure and run message passing daemon. Step two, there is no step two, and step three is profit, of course, because it's very easy to build up. So remember the basic concept, inputs, filter, outputs. So looking at the, the graph, the diagram you still have in mind, what are we going to build? We are going to use message passing DSL, okay, because we pick up, we're going to use the easy interface. And then we use moves with message passing role script. That means that, yeah, we are, actually writing a script that will run at, as a daemon here at the bottom. So, 
And then we have to implement one method, which is build chain. And message passing will call you, uh, call this method, and uh, you're supposed to build your chain, your message chain here. So it's a nice uh, set of keywords. So here we say, hey, our chain is actually one input here. Uh, so this is actually looking, this is a file tail, which is uh, just doing a tail, you know, on our named pipe that comes from syslogng. And so we configure it saying, okay, this is where you have to take it from. And you output to cleanup logs, okay? What's cleanup logs? Oh, it's defined here. It's actually a filter because uh, the logs that come from uh, the existing system they are not really clean and they contain some stuff at the, the start of the string and then the JSON uh, structure that we build up with log message structure. So we need uh, to build up a special filter that will uh, strip what's not needed in the string and then uh, de-JSONify it. And so that's uh, also uh, an excuse to uh, show you how to build a filter. And when this filter is finished, it will output to two outputs. One is Elasticsearch and one is MongoDB. And then that's very easy. You, so you define two outputs. The Elasticsearch, you point it to the server. And the MongoDB, you give it the hostname, database, and the collections. And also here, yeah, you, you should give it the indexes. Except that at the time we used message passing, MongoDB didn't exist. There were no outputs. So we had to build it, and actually it was done in, I don't know, two hours or something like that. So I'm going to show you how it's done. It's very easy to build outputs, very easy to build inputs and filters. So if you use message passing, you can contribute very easily. Here we come, we start with the code of our filter, which is very easy. What is a filter? It's an object that has a method called consume that will receive a message. So in our case, the not so clean message from syslogng. What we do is we have a stupid regex, we apply it. If it doesn't match, then we just don't do anything. If it matches, then we retrieve the log level from the, 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 the crappy log message. And uh, we loop on all the outputs of this filter and we send the structured log to the output, to each of the outputs, okay? So that's basically how a filter works, it receives one message, do stuff, and the stuff should end up with a JSON structured message by convention and you, you should loop on all the outputs that are connected to your filter and call consume it, so very easy. Here is the output to MongoDB that didn't exist, we need to write it, but it's very easy as well. You, yeah, you consume a bunch of roles, you say that you are an, actually a message passing output, you have username and password and hostname and port, and you configure your database so that you can actually connect to MongoDB, so that's really MongoDB stuff, not very interesting. We have also our log collection, which is a small collection into our um, MongoDB, so that's also MongoDB related, not that interested. And we have to implement the consume method that received data. And we only have to really insert it into MongoDB. Okay, because the output receives data and is supposed to write it to MongoDB. Uh, and also what we do in addition is, uh, it's not written here, here but uh, we uh, make sure that the, da the data is indexed on all the fields. And that's available on CPAN. Now let's look at the Dancer web GUI. It's a very simple Dancer application. Uh, we could have used Dancer plugin Mongo, but we did for some reason. And we only need a screen to display log and a screen to search, to, do, uh, to perform simple search on the logs. And what we want is the result page to always show logs ordered by time because it's an easy interface. It's not a data mining interface. So it should look like this. That's a screenshot. Here you have the 
commands that were executed, uh, you know, some fields that come from your logs, they are grouped together, and uh, you also have the PID and the number of log lines per uh, task, and you can uh, click on them to uh, see the details, and you can also search. So when you click on search, you can just enter numbers in the search field and do search. It's very ugly, but we don't care. Uh, to do that, we have uh, denser GUI roots. Uh, so we set up get slash that only does uh, group requests on MongoDB because now everything is in MongoDB uh, thanks to message passing. And we get a result and uh, get slash search displays the input fields and uh, issue requests to slash results. And slash results gets the search parameters from the URL and it issues a fine request in MongoDB. And because all the fields are indexed, it's uh, very fast. And then you get the list of results. And you display that in a table. And clicking on a single result, we added a pop-up to show the raw uh, JSON uh, structure. Oh yeah, I have a video of that. Yeah, it's running. But it's not showing, is it? No. Sorry about that. So if I do this, yeah, if I do that. Uh. OK, so we are going to look at it like that. OK, so that's an example of uh, searching. And so here you have only the logs about uh, account ID number one. And you can click on it and have the raw display of the data structure. So here it renders very badly because of the video. But basically, you can see all the details and all the feeds about uh, your, uh, the log lines. Okay. So I don't know what I'm doing next in this video. Yeah, yeah, OK. That's the raw uh, data of your log. So you can see that one of the benefits of using log message structured is that you actually get a lot of information, which are contextual. And um, at first, you don't remember that uh, you have uh, all this contextual information. But at the end, when it's in the database and someone is asking about it, you remember, oh, yeah, I have this information for two months, and it's indexed, and then I can search on it, and it's very useful. Now, Elasticsearch. You know, remember we wanted a, a data mining tool to be able to do uh, complex queries on all our logs. Thanks to message passing, now that the daemon is running, is picking up the logs and outputting to MongoDB, but also to Elasticsearch. And let's see about the installation. It's trivial. The configuration, there is no configuration. To set up an Elasticsearch server really is very easy. And also, yeah, the web interface, we don't need to build it. It's already built. It's a plugin that you uh, install in Elasticsearch. We used Elasticsearch head, but there are other Elasticsearch web interface. So there is just to install uh, this plugin. And there is no code to show because there is nothing. Really, we didn't have to write one single line of code to have the, this web interface upon Elasticsearch, which is quite good. The usage, yeah, perform advanced search on massive backlog. And when I say massive, it's really massive. And you can put a lot of stuff at it. And it will be intelligent enough to index everything and recognize uh, your data. For instance, if your data is a timestamp, then it will uh, automatically recognize that it's a, a time. And then it will be able to show you histograms and diagrams and whatnot. So that's an example. So yeah, it's a bit uh, crowded. But uh, here on the left, you have all the filters that you can change. And in real time, you will have only the log lines that 
match your uh, filters. And so that's very powerful, but you can see that it's a bit different from the other interface. I, I cannot point um, by, uh, I don't know, uh, commercial or business guy to this interface. You know, it's too complex. Uh, so that's why we beat the other one. And yeah, when you click on one uh, line, you also have the structured representation of the JSON as we did. And here, just an example to show you that because it's uh, some of the fields are timestamp here of when it started, when it finished, and how much time it took. Then uh, Elasticsearch, by, by uh, I mean, really alone, I discovered that uh, <laughs> afterward, uh, it will just group, uh, show you a histogram grouping all the log lines per date. And you can actually have much more histogram automatically, and you can print that and send that to your bus. And so I still have a video. Uh, if it works, yeah. So it's, uh, yeah. So here we can see that we have a lot of fields. Okay, so that's all our uh, logs that were structured using log message structured. And we have a lot of data. And uh, they are all displayed here. And that's all the filters. So what are we going to do? Yeah, filter on uh, this field, which is conversion page ID. And you can see that, yeah, only one here. And yeah, I'm not very good with web interface, as you can see. Yeah, that's the raw uh, data of one log structure. Okay. And here, when, what is it? Mm. Yeah, here we have the histogram of the timestamp. And so when you click on the one bar, it actually updates, it shows you the timestamp and it updates the result list you have on the right. And I think that's really what it's about. It. Anyway, I think you got the point. So really, that's all there is about message passing. One additional stuff, which is we've written our filter and our output and what's not, and okay, it's cool. Except, let's say we output to MongoDB and in our output class, there is an error, okay? We don't want to just print to the console, okay? We want to log about the error. But if we log about the error and it goes back to message passing and tries to output it to MongoDB and the error is still there and goes back to message passing and tries to output it to MongoDB, you have a loop. And to avoid that uh, loop uh, that getting bigger and bigger and then explodes, uh, there is a special error channel in message passing that you can configure to say, OK, all the logs that come from outside, you handle it like that. But if you have logs that come from message passing because you have an error, then just output it to a file or something like that. That's to avoid the loop of this. And yeah, I hope I have shown how easy it is to set up uh, web interfaces and more importantly a whole new structure on how to easily log all your stuff coming from a, a whole bunch of machines of different log uh, formats and system to merge them all together with log message structured and uh, message passing and then you are free to do whatever you want logging to database uh, to files uh, plug web interface to it and so on so message passing is easy and works great. We use it in production. It's very good. And it's easy to contribute to rights components, uh, outputs, inputs, and filters. So please, yeah, uh, contribute. And log message structured is that simple, but it's a good idea. So uh, it does the job properly. And yeah, if you have time, just uh, contribute as well. And that's about it. If you have any questions.
One question over there. Uh, I, uh, I don't know. We are at the pre-production state. So we have, uh, how much do we have? We are handling uh, around 1 million lines per day, which is very few. Uh, 200,000 at least per hour. And yeah, we have one, at least one log line per data line we're handling. So 200,000 lines per hour, and yeah, it works fine. <coughs> Surprisingly, I would say, because knowing the author and so on. But yeah. Any other questions? Yes? Do you use uh, Elasticsearch standard um, database, or do you have a robot into, into Mongo? Or I, uh, w actually, I was with my uh, developer, and I didn't know anything about Elasticsearch. We installed. It worked on a local machine, and we, <laughs> we did nothing at all. We installed this plugin, the uh, head, and uh, no, we used the default database. Maybe at some point where we have you know, uh, tons of data, we will switch to something else if, it's more, if we have issues. But for now, we have no issues at all. Do we have another question? No? Zero minutes, so thank you very much.